Okay, uh, thank you all for tuning in. These uh, digital times have their own unique set of hurdles and uh, challenges. We're smoothing them out, we're making it work, and uh, we're gonna have a really great program tonight. I really appreciate you for joining. I'm gonna pull up a few quick notes. Let's see if I can do that and uh, see if we can get rolling. So good evening and welcome to ACP's lecture series. We appreciate you tuning in for tonight's event with photographer Joshua Rashad McFadden. A few quick notes before we get started. ACP would like to thank MailChimp, Fulton County Arts Council, and the Atlanta Office for Cultural Affairs for their sustaining support of this program. Also, a special thank you to the Film and Media Department at Emory University and Matthew Bernstein. In a minute, I'm gonna hand off to author, essayist, photographer, Jason Francisco, who teaches in the Film and Media Department at Emory University. And Jason will be introducing Joshua and leading a discussion with him after Joshua's presentation. Now, as the program progresses tonight, you have a question, please feel free to click that QA button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We might not get to all the questions, but that's where to submit one. And while we all might miss gathering together in a real space for the ACP lecture series, at least we're here together in real time. Um, please know that if everything goes according to plan, we'll soon have a recording available on our YouTube channel of tonight's event at acpinfo.org slash YouTube. So thank you for being here, and I'm going to hand things over to Jason Francisco. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I'd like to quickly thank you again, Michael, and to Bex and ACP for um, sponsoring this event, uh, also part of our fall speaker series in photography at Emory. And I'm very honored and proud and glad to welcome you, Joshua, to our, uh, our event tonight. Um, by way of a short introduction, um, I know Joshua's work. I think I first heard your name, Joshua, and I first saw your work in the New York Times Lens blog uh, some time ago. And since then, uh, your name and your work have been falling into my, my inbox over and over again. And um, uh, by way of, um, I guess, general introduction, uh, Joshua, you're joining us from Rochester, New York, um, where uh, Josh is an assistant professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology teaching photography. And, um, as I know, you're originally from Rochester, New York. Uh, so I guess it's something of a homecoming to, to be back in Rochester. Um, Joshua uh, earned his, um, his BA in fine art from uh, Elizabeth City State University in North Carolina, and then uh, spent some time here in Atlanta um, completing his MFA at, uh, at SCADS at the Savannah College of Art and design here in Atlanta. Um, Joshua's work, I, th I think in, in my understanding falls into two main streams of activity. One of them um, is a series of works that pursues um, questions about um, male identity, about masculinity, um, and specifically about selfhood and the image of the father as it resides in, um, in consciousness. And there are a series of uh, photo works and installation works um, um, that have come year by year um, investigating these uh, interrelated uh, themes. Um, and alongside that, there's a, a, another series of works that is more I guess, publicly directed that deals with, um, that deals with the legacy of uh, police brutality and racist violence um, against African-Americans that has been 
um, playing out in the streets of American cities for generations, but especially as we all know this particular year um, with the movement for black lives that, uh, that, that was catalyzed um, in the late spring and with the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. And um, Joshua has been a remarkable presence on the streets of American cities, many American cities, as I think we'll see tonight, um, with the protests uh, consistently, constantly um, pro producing, I think, one of the really important collections of work by a single photographer on, um, on the public face of the movement for racial justice in 2020 in America. And his work has been uh, already, even in, even in this incomplete stage, because of course we're still in the middle of it, uh, his work has become um, well known, especially through publications um, through, through CNN and Time Magazine. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm, once again, I'm very glad to welcome you here and um, thank you for Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, is it time to begin, I guess? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, great. Well, thank hey, you. Hey, great. Thank you again. Um, thank you, Emory University. Thank you, Atlanta Celebrates Photography, um, for inviting me to share my work with you all. Um, Thank you, Jason and Michael. And then thank you to our participants that joined us tonight. Um, I look forward to hearing your questions and to having you know, a, a great conversation after the presentation. Um, so I'm going to attempt <laughs> to show you a good portion of my work while still leaving enough time for conversation. Um, and hopefully you'll start to see the common threads between each body of work. Well, I will share my screen and we'll get going. All right, so just give me a thumbs up if that's okay, Jason. Okay, so I wanna start here um, with a project that I started or made in 2015. I created a project called After Selma in response to the unrest in Ferguson, Missouri that involved protests and riots uh, that began on August 10th, 2014, the day after the fatal shooting of Michael Brown by police officer, Darren Wilson. Uh, 2015 was also the 50th commemoration of Bloody Sunday and the march from Selma, from Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and so the, after, the aftermath of Bloody Sunday and the march from Selma to Alabama, I mean, from Selma to Montgomery pushed Congress to pass the Voters' Rights Acts of 1965, which guaranteed the right to vote for all African-Americans. Uh, the act also banned things like the literacy test that, require, that was a requirement for voting. Um, it also mandated federal oversight of voters registration, okay? So that happened in 1965, um, led by Martin Luther King, a march and demonstration from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery. And during this 50th year commemoration, um, in 2015, I began to ask myself, you know, where are we now? Why 50, why are we still marching for rights that we supposedly gotten in 1965? Why are we still marching in 2015 for the same things? Um, specifically now, police brutality. And so I went to Selma, Alabama, to photograph the people there um, who participated in this commemoration, participated in this march. Um, and in these images, you'll begin to see uh, this kind of cycle and this kind of repetition. Um, you'll see 
people who marched in the march in 1965, marching again in 2015. You'll see mar multiple generations marching. You'll see the Edmund Pettus Bridge. You'll see people with smartphones on this bridge. You uh, start to see, for example, in this image, a woman who marched in 1965, uh, yet behind her, you'll see part of a Black Lives Matter banner, right? And in 2015, Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement was still in its early phase. And of course now 2020, it's become one of the largest, largest um, civil rights movement today. So in 2015, again, I was starting to think about um, how history is repeating itself. Hence why I chose to photograph this series in black and white um, to, uh, I guess, invoke um, civil rights photographers of the past. Um, some of my favorite photographers, Roy DeCarava, um, Monetta Sleet, Gordon Parks, so on and so forth. And so um, backing up a little bit, following the murder of Trayvon Martin, which happened in 2012, um, that was a moment that kind of rocked my generation to its core. We've never seen an uprising um, of this stature in our generation, um, a high profile case of, um, of, of violence against uh, you know, a young black boy, really, uh, but also a moment where this case was broadcast as over the you know over the entire world, and it started the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I started to think about this and perception of African Americans, um, specifically perceptions of African American men. Um, Trayvon Martin's murder was a moment that changed our generation's notions of freedom here in America. Um, I distinctly remember conversations surrounding the black male, um, what he was wearing, a hoodie, a black hoodie. And I thought to myself, why are black men perceived as a threat no matter what they do? I began to also question the role that imagery plays in shaping the ideas of the black men and who controls that image. So I started to look back and mine the personal archive, dig through the personal archive. Um, and with my fascination of this archival um, image or the vernacular image, I started to investigate how the vernacular image could be used to convey humanity, specifically the image of the black father figure positioned as a role model. Um, I realized that I could use vernacular imagery to convey the humanity of the black man and the role models because it reflects on the family life, the ordinary life, something which everybody can relate to. Um, vernacular, photo, vernacular photographs of African-American life are often missing from the museum setting and in popular media. But these Im images are very relevant because they uh, depict common traditions, they predict, uh, depict values, core, core values, and um, our culture. So really there are, they are essential objects that reveal both intimate and collective identities, meaning um, ways that uh, maybe a group may identify with each other. So these images, these types of images expose the narrative of, narrative of Black life, but also show the joy and beauty of the community. So if I, if I back up, here's an image um, of the in-between kind of moments. We don't really know what's happening in the photograph. Maybe the family, um, um, the, the family that this photograph um, belongs to, maybe they can recall the specific moment this photograph was taken. It, you know, um, memory recall. You can see the smile on his face. Um, you know, he's simply just expressing joy. And then you have black men in the military, um, a young man in the US Air Force enjoying a meal. Um, we see and understand that young African-American men also chose to fight for this country. Um, it reminds me 
of African-American men and women who have fought and died in protection of a country that has continually refused them civil and human rights, even to this day. Um, we have images of fathers embracing their young babies, um, the depiction of intimacy, the touch, the embrace. Um, Black fathers are expressing affection and showing tenderness. Uh, we have images to where, you know, it's obvious that um, whoever made this image may not be a professional or there's just a happy mistake, but there's still importance of this image, right? People still um, keep and, and care for this, this type of um, photograph, even though there's a finger right in front of the lens here. I think we all have a photograph like this. And so here I wanted to begin to use a collaborative approach to tell these stories of young black men, asking them to provide an old image of their father figure from when the father figure was in his early twenties. Sometimes you'll see the images of grandfathers like this, or sometimes great grandfathers, such as Raheem Pounds who um, provided an image of his great grandfather. Raheem was actually um, adopted and chose to um, find um, his great-great-grandfather to participate in, or a photo of his great-great-grandfather to participate in this project, um, which um, spoke volumes, I think. Um, and you'll see images of their fathers when they're in their early 20s. Sometimes you'll see um, images of their fathers when they're the same age as their son in the contemporary image of the left here. I found that these uh, young men had to go back and look for these images in their attic, you know, at their grandmother's house. They had to ask their parents for old images. They had to ask their grandparents for old images um, that may be even, you know, under a bed or in a shoebox or in storage. Um, and so this is now the act of mining the family archive, mining the personal archive placing importance in these images, um, looking at your family tree, looking at your family history and knowing that there's power in that history. These young in, uh, men ended up learning so much about their history just from inquiring about this single photograph. Uh, the participants came to sit with me for a portrait only after we um, spent time talking about their, experiencing, their experience uh, finding the photograph, then answering questions about living in America uh, drawing the connections between their existence and their father figure's experiences. Um, I ask questions like, who is the ideal figure or role model and why? And so then you see the handwritten text um, on the bottom right, uh, which is the young man's uh, personal narrative, where they share, openly share their personal narrative with, with the viewer, with me and the, with the viewer. Um, we begin to read these narratives together and you'll realize that um, there is a flow and a common thread between each narrative. Um, and so when I collected the archival images of the father figure and paired them with contemporary portraits um, that I made of their sons and also collected handwritten narratives about experiences, the result is a collective story that you can't ignore um, because we all identify with family, love, hardship, acceptance, rejection, triumph, and reconciliation. Um, so I'm just gonna read some snippets um, of each narrative as you look through some of these images. Um, you know, I'll kind of go pretty quickly so we have enough time. Um, and so I, when, you, when you see these images and when you hear the narratives, I want you to imagine um, your son or your child, your father, um, or even just your neighbor, people you know, um, and try to see that common thread. So here we have, we are human, plain and simple. We cry, we laugh, we fight, we create, we love, we sympathize, we dream, just like the rest of the human race. But more often than not, people see us as violent, ignorant, criminals, loud, aggressive, as drug dealers, 
and that we trap. And these perceptions impact me every day, impact my every day. I am automatically stereotyped because of my skin color. I do not see being black as a negative thing. For me, I get to be a part of a rich legacy of struggle and of triumph. I'm a part of one of the most creative groups of people on the planet. And I'm a real leader of change. To me, black masculinity is a liquid. It's loose and easily manipulated. I love Andre 3000 because he exists within the hip hop world without selling himself to be the co common rap icon. He has a strong sense of expression. No, actually the singer Sylvester, though not likely Id the idealized version of black masculinity, Sylvester embodies what masculinity means to me. I was often told by my father at a young age that I was a black man and that my life would be harder because of it. I later understood that our world operates in symbols and labels. I watched the uh, people's first assumptions of me immediately disappear when I begin to speak. Perceptions cause people to look at me like I'm dumb or illiterate. So many people are surprised to hear how intellectual I am and taking the time to get to know me, after taking the time to get to know me. I don't believe there's an ideal figure of black male masculinity. Manliness is a series of qualities that we categorize into a particular group. No one can be 100% masculine. It's impossible. If anything, the black male who doesn't chase such ideals would ironically become the ideal figure. Masculinity is a phantom to me. I personally try to move towards it, but I can never fully grasp it. I have friends who have been physically beaten, harassed, and killed because of their true identity. Being Black is one thing, but being Black and queer poses a different topic of discussion. And I'll end Come to Self with what Jeremiah Thompson because it was an interesting moment for us and an interesting moment for me while creating this project. Jeremiah is from Orlando, Florida, and he talks about how he identifies as a gay Black man and how he used to be afraid of his, for his life because of it. And we made his photograph in June of 2016. Um, and the night after we made his portrait, the mass shooting at the gay nightclub Pulse happened in Orlando, Florida, where he's from. He said to me that that could have been me because every time Jeremiah goes home to visit, he would often frequent that nightclub and he has known friends that were killed that night in that nightclub. So how does one begin to challenge the misguided perceptions that decrease the quality of living for young African-American men? Furthermore, how does the African-American man position himself in a society that doesn't acknowledge his true identity? African-American men and stories of their intersecting identities are unrecognized in forms that allow these positive images to become a part of the dominant narrative. So I choose to use portraiture, um, the vernacular image, qualitative data, um, and positioning to, to expose this narrative. Um, and by diving into history and diving into um, varied experiences, this project begins to make the invisible visible. Um, and so moving forward, I started to explore this idea um, further, um, the idea of, you know, the idea about what Black, ma black masculinity is, um, but now going into ideas of gender construction, gender identity. Um, and I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia um, at HBCU. Um, that is also an all, all male school um, or was, you know, historically known as, you know, uh, all male school or a traditional, uh, the traditional sense 
So I was beginning to not only look at identity construction, but also the fact that these people are self, are within an institution known for conservative black male leaders such as Martin Luther King, and then having to or not identify with that legacy or change that legacy. And so the prompt for this section was, I am a man, which was a slogan from the sanit sanitation worker strike in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968, which was the last demonstration uh, for Martin Luther King before his assassination. Um, and so I traveled to the school to um, ask these young people to uh, give their opinions on gender um, uh, and the shifting conversation surrounding gender, gender identity in America. And here's images from my project that I did with uh, Smithsonian Magazine in Memphis, Tennessee, photographing um, surviving members of the sanitation worker strike, which their slogan was, I am a man. And then I traveled to Brooklyn, New York to continue this project, but in a different way, um, stripping down the portrait to black and white portrait, more simple um, and placing more prominence um, in the handwritten narrative. Um, giving a simple prompt and asking these, asking these people to uh, respond to this prompt. Um, and for example, here, um, Jermel, he says in his first sentence, I've seen this phrase, I've heard this phrase, but I do not feel this phrase. Okay, so they're starting to complicate this phrase, you know, can we begin to start to rethink this idea of be a man or I am a man um, and all of it's the history that comes with, with that term and that saying? Here's an extra, I'll read an interesting snippet from this one. My initial thought when uttering these words is, what does that exactly mean? I don't rightly know. I suppose it denotes my manliness. Perhaps it signifies that I have come of age and have stepped into a certain role, a societal role as an adult male. Um, it brings up feelings of ina inadequacy, sometimes, of having to prove that I am strong uh, and courageous enough, so on and so forth. That brings me to Rochester, New York. I traveled back home to Rochester, New York in 2018. And when I arrived to Rochester, New York, um, news broke that um, Frederick da Douglass statues have been um, vandalized or stolen um, in the city. And if you know anything, you know, a little bit about Frederick Douglass is that he lived here in Rochester, New York. He actually um, moved here, lived, um, was an abolitionist here, um, started a newspaper, the North Star here, died here and is buried here. Um, and knowing Frederick Douglass history with the portrait, um, the self, the self portrait, right? Uh, or the self posed portrait, he became one of the most, photo, you know, the most photographed men in America of his time, um, and he was known to uh, use portraiture to construct his image, his self-image, and uh, and present himself and how how he wanted to be presented. And he was one of the main influences for my projects, Come to Selfhood, and I Am a Man. Um, you'll notice that the portraits in Come to Selfhood are posed in the likes of someone in the likes of Frederick Douglass. But here in Rochester, I went to the site where the statue was stolen um, and people were protesting at the site. And I made this photograph of a man who brought his image of, of Frederick Douglass. And that kind of um, spoke to me because we learned a lot about him um, growing up, not necessarily in the school system, but from our parents and programs that they involved us in. 
And so that eventually led me to um, looking into the North Star, the newspaper that was created in Rochester, New York by Frederick Douglass, published by Frederick Douglass. Um, and here's an image of that paper um, for that been an exhibit called Evans, which was the result of all of the work that I did at Morehouse University in Brooklyn, New York with I Am The Man, and it all came together as evidence where I created a newspaper in the likes of the North Star in Rochester, New York, that um, houses all of these narratives um, uh, detailing these, these ideas of freedom, these ideas of gender, um, being a man, masculinity, um, so on and so forth. Um, but then also provide an experience to where people can um, bring this newspaper home with them, but also engage the paper with the portraits and the, 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 the handwritten documents. Um, and so these images actually were from an opening in Rochester, New York at Visual, um, Visual, Visual Studies Workshop. And um, that was in February of 2020 this year. And soon after, of course, we were on shutdown because of the pandemic that we're in right now, which is why I'm speaking to you all on Zoom, right? So the exhibit shut down um, I was able to kind of ship out newspapers, you know, across the country to people. Um, but soon after, we uh, news broke about George Floyd. Um, news broke about George Floyd, and we were pushed into the next phase of the movement for Black Lives. And when I heard news about George Floyd and what happened and saw the video, I was moved to go to Minneapolis to document what was happening. Um, and I haven't photographed a protest since 2017 when Philando Castile was, was killed. And I, I didn't photograph any protests since then because I felt um, um, uh, a deep, a deep, um, depression after the murder of Philando Castile, which ironically also happened in Minneapolis. And it was because it, it, it almost brought uh, about a hopelessness. You know, where, why are we still experiencing this police brutality, the same things that, you know, our fathers, our mothers have dealt with, our grandparents have dealt with, great, great grandparents going, you know, then we can just go back through the line of violence, you know, for 400 years. And I began to think about, well, is, is this work working? Do I need to, do I need to approach my work in a new, in a new way? So I focused on, you know, making the portraits at Morehouse, so on and so forth. But once evidence was evidence and the show opened, this happened with George Floyd. So I found myself going back to begin documenting protests again. And I found myself in Minneapolis documenting um, something, things that I've never seen before. You know, there was such a hurt and pain in this city. Um, um, you could feel it, it was in the air. Um, a deep, deep, deep sadness. And so you saw protest every night. You saw um, standoffs with police officers, the National Guard, curfews, so on and so forth. You saw public arts pieces spring up across the city, such like uh, such as this, um, this um, install at a local park near the um, near the location where uh, George Floyd was was murdered. The Cup Foods store, um, and this is a cemetery, say the name cemetery, where you'll see um, headstones that were made for people who were killed by police. Um, this is a photograph at the site where George Floyd was killed. 
Um, and you'll see this in um, most of the images that I'll show and the places that I've traveled, you'll see that these memorial sites pop up and they fill up with flowers and, and portraits of um, the person who was killed and people come and, and, and pay their respects. And so this is one of those images. You'll see people marching in the streets. Um, you see the repeated um, um, saying, you know, well, I can't breathe. And that brings us back to Eric Gardner in New York City. Um, you see people protesting from cars, which was a um, something that was repeated in each city as well. Um, this image, the police shine a light on a young man who was walking down the street at the cat curfew. Um, and so that's like the spotlight here. Um, and he has his hands up. They did end up shooting um, a rubber, rubber bullet at him. After Minneapolis I actually traveled to Atlanta, Georgia to do a story for Washington Post. And the same night I got there, I drove overnight. The same night I got there, um, Rayshard Brooks was killed by police at a Wendy's in Atlanta, Georgia. And Atlanta was already experiencing uprise because of George Floyd and then Rayshard Brooks was then murdered. And so I found myself documenting protests again. Um, I believe that was in June, documenting protests again in June um, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and Atlanta was a bit different than Minneapolis because you saw more of um, close, close, uh, what's the word? Close, closer standoffs between the community and police officers. You saw more, uh, you know, you saw people standing close to police officers, speaking to them, um, and you'll see black police officers in conflict with, you know, their community, black, the, the black community. Um, and so you can see that in this image here, and I, you can only wonder what, what this person is thinking. as protesters asked them, how could he be a police officer um, and not stand up for Rayshard Brooks? Again, the memorial site, people protesting at memorial sites, this one at Wendy's, the site where Rayshard Brooks was killed, standing off with police officers here. Um, and uh, even within you know, these huge moments of chaos, I do um, like to um, um, try to focus in and make portraits, I think, to, for me, capturing the expression in these small moments. But then this greater moment is, is important for me. Um, you saw young people at the protest. This is also in Atlanta. And then I traveled to Louisville, Kentucky, um, where Breonna Taylor was murdered at her home. In, in Kentucky. And Louisville was, 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 hmm. Louisville was interesting. I think Louisville, um, you know, well, if you back up, um, I say her name was made, that slogan was made because when black women, are killed by police officers, it's less, less likely to become a big movement um, because they these deaths go ignored very often. And so say her name was created back when I believe Sandra Bland was killed and people chanted say her name. And now it's important to, to chant say her name for Breonna Taylor um, in this instance. And to be there to photograph um, people that were close to Breonna Taylor, such as her cousins and her friends, to ask them, you know, um, what was Breonna, Breonna Taylor like? You know, um, um, how did she interact with her um, friends and her loved ones? And to hear how, you know, how much of a hardworking person she was and how, you know, you can um, follow her tweets on, uh, 
on Twitter and, and kind of just follow her life. And it was terribly sad um, to, to see um, the hurt and the pain that her family and friends are experiencing. Um, and for them to, they almost thought that her story wouldn't get out, but they persisted and got her story out. Um, and the whole world heard about Breonna Taylor and what happened. And so you saw people um, protesting, um, I believe it's called Jefferson Square Park. That's where this image was taken. Um, they put her name up in the trees at Jefferson Square Park and community members protested every day. They're still protesting now. And um, you'll see a portrait of Kenneth Walker. Um, I made a Kenneth Walker, Brianna Taylor's boyfriend, um, who was there the night um, she was killed. And, you know, just he talked about his experience, so on and so forth. Um, all of this work was done. You can find it, um, I guess, um, in the New York Times if you want to read the story. Another image from um, Jefferson Square Park. Again, the memorial signs, it says, arrest the cops who killed Breonna Taylor. And these people are at this park hours, you know, for many, many hours in the day, in the night, 24 seven, you'll see somebody protesting for Breonna Taylor, her apartment. Um, this is a protest at um, AG, um, Daniel Cameron's house. Um, protesters held a sit-in at their house and they're surrounded by police officers. Police officers then arrested each protester um, and charged them with felonies. Um, I'm not sure if those charges um, are still there, if they stuck. And then you have Tamika Palmer, who is the mother of Breonna Taylor at the memorial site. Washington, DC, where um, the commitment march happened, the commitment march, which occurred on you know, the commemoration of the March on Washington. But this year, um, of course, people gathered in the midst of the pandemic to protest police brutality. And I was there to capture moments like these, a mother and her child at the Lincoln Memorial. Soon after the March on Washington, I returned to Rochester, New York, and Daniel Prude happened. Well, the video of Daniel Prude's murder at the hands of police officers in Rochester, New York, my hometown. And I was shocked to see that he was murdered before George Floyd here in Rochester. And so who knows, you know, if this police video was released then, like it should have, um, would that have changed the course of, you know, this past summer and um, legislation, so on and so forth? We don't know, but all we know is this happened here in my hometown and then here I am um, documenting protest um, again, and protesters are being gassed, gassed, um, shot with pepper pellets, rubber bullets, attacked by police officers. Um, something that I've seen the entire summer, spring, summer. Um, we have Joe Prude here, Daniel Prude's brother, who I photographed at his home, who spoke about. Um, um, his last moments with his brother. Community members in Rochester marching. We see, um, you know, of course it's 2020. So the, the live streaming of protest um, happening. And I believe this is the last image a moment where protesters were trapped in a church in Rochester, New York, um, trapped because police officers surrounded them. And so I captured this, captured this image of two protesters inside the church um, 
waiting to when they can leave. Okay, and that's my presentation. I, uh, I just want to remind uh, the uh, people who are attending that uh, you can ask questions in the Q&A uh, box, which is sitting um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I'd be interested to, um, to give those questions to, to Joshua. Um, I have some thoughts. Maybe I can begin with my own uh, a question or two of my own. Um, Joshua, as you're, as you're talking, there's, um, there's a question in my mind about whether the word protest is even the right word to describe what you're doing um, in the sense that your, your work shows that you're, you're interested not just in a, in a sort of reaction, a community reaction to what's going on, but you're building a, um, a deep vision, a kind, you're, you're involved in, in revisioning or re, uh, reworking the image of, not just of what black manhood is and black masculinity is, but what community response is and how it is that people are thinking together, collaborating, co-thinking. Uh, in a sense, you're, you're beginning to describe uh, what we want to replace the system of oppression with. And so in that sense, the, the word protest is, describes an aspect of what you're doing. But I think that it, it, what you're doing actually goes much further than that because it's, it's not just uh, reactive, but it's very constructive. And, um, and I wonder whether you have thoughts about the role of a photographer, um, especially in the, in the mode of um, the non-studio work that you're doing. The, the mode of being out there in the world as it's happening in front of you where you can't control the events, you can't control the lighting, you know, you're, you're, you're basically, you're, you're in the midst of a world that's ongoing. And um, so sh giving it shape, um, especially positive shape um, is, is a particular challenge. And I wonder whether you, whether you think about that when you're out, when you're out photographing in, um, in public places or in, you know, in, um, in, in the midst of collective uprising. Um, so you're asking when I'm in the midst, you know, of, of happenings in the world, and I don't have control. What do I? Well, do? how do you? Yeah. Well, how do you imagine the constructive work that you're doing and giving image to to this this collective moment this in, based in the streets um, which is itself unscripted and you know, it's following it's it's following its own logic its own nature but you're a photographer you're not just re you're not just passive you're not just recording what's going on you're producing it in the form of images and so I wonder you know well so I think um, it's easy of course, in, in moments of photographing protests, you know, we can just use that word because that's, you know, I guess what, you know, what's happening. However, I think you have people who go to witness the protests, you have people who are active in the protest, people go to protest for many different reasons. You, you'll you'll um, understand that, you know, people kind of stand on the sidelines, people are, you know, marching in the streets. There's, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of ways that people yeah. when they're there. Um, and then you have the, the photographers, the journalists um, in this moment that's happening. Um, and they're all serving their, um, their roles. And so, you know, I think me, for me, when I go, um, it's, it, I'm in a, I, I think I'm in a, like a particular, I'm in a kind of two, or three roles here because I do identify deeply, like let's say with, with George Floyd, right? Um, that could have been someone um, in my family. That could have been me. I, I, I know what it's like to be profiled and to be wrongfully questioned when doing a simple task. So that's, that doesn't leave me. 
when I'm out there. It can't because I am human. I, um, a lot of people expect journalists to um, kind of forego all of those experiences, but you know, it would be a lie to say that I do. And so when I'm there, I'm there with those, um, with having there with having those experiences. But I'm also, for example, like mm, interested in kind of looking at moments like um, these, like this one in Atlanta, right? Um, looking at this image, um, I I saw this moment happening with this particular um, police officer. Um, you can see that it's the same police officer here in this image, right? Interacting with um, and this young man's um, voicing his opinion directly to the police officer and the conversations about the community, like men being murdered by police officers. So I saw that as a, a special moment that I wanted to capture, how I wanted to capture it, not just to get this kind of wide shot of a protest. And so I say, well, how can I maneuver around? I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of people. I think because I'm a short person, you know, I'm able to kind of, you know, squeeze through people to get a certain shot. But that's what I had to do to kind of get this portrait of, of this police officer to see so that the viewer can look into his eyes and kind of read his reaction and his face in this moment. Um, um, it, it reminds me of, of a painting done by Basquiat um, questioning the role of a black police officer. I think it was the irony of, a, um, it was either irony of a black police officer or a Negro policeman. And it's talking about black police officer who, who takes a role in the death of black men unjustly. And so anywho, that's what I saw here and I, I believe that um, what you're talking about is taking taking a um, constructive approach to documenting protest, if that's what people want to call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know this this photograph uh, really stood out to me in your presentation, also, um, partly because uh, it it's such a sympathetic portrayal of this police officer in this moment, and it seems to, in a sense stop the the events going on around it to enter into the into the psyche or into the into the mind of um of this person uh who seems almost lost in his own thoughts or or lost in his own his own questions or or comprehension or incomprehension um i, I having been to a lot of these protests also um here in atlanta I, of course, I know. I noted. I couldn't help but note that black police officers were uh, often on the very front lines of these protests, and that didn't seem accidental. And they were often um, uh, the 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 subjects or the objects of a great deal of uh, invective and harsh condemnation and comments from protesters, especially from black folk protesters. And uh, so that your, your photograph really goes a, quite a long way in, um, in addressing that particular corner of, uh, of the protests. Um, I, have, I have further questions, but I wonder whether we shouldn't get to, uh-huh. Yeah, I know that my voice might be lagging with my video for a, a second or two here, but um, we do have some questions from the audience, Jason, and I'd yes. like to uh, get them out, even if some of them are just kind of quick answer ones, Joshua, that oh. you could tackle. But there's a couple in a similar vein, and I want to group them together. And it's essentially your projects have a lot of emotion to them, especially with covering the protests uh, in the last year how are you processing your own feelings as not just a photographer, but as a human being? How do you mitigate this pressure and the negative effects of being around uh, so much strife um, that's happening this year? Um, well, <laughs> tough question. It's hard to do that. It's hard um, when it's so constant. 
So, um, for example, like when I said in 2017, I stopped photographs and protests, I almost just stopped making photographs at all. <laughs> so, uh, in it, there was a gap in time. So, um, I believe Philando Castile, um, that happened in the summertime, in summer 2016. And I didn't start making photographs again until fall, I mean, not fall, maybe spring. 2018, um, because I was exhausted, you know, um, you know, making work, especially pro with protest, um, you know, I, I think, you know, we were just off the cups of an election, now we're in another one, and it's just, oh my gosh, what a, what a year. You know, it, it does get, it gets exhausting, it gets emotionally exhausting, um, physically, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the press were getting shot with rubber bullets. <laughs> Literally, I, I got shot with them or gassed, all of that. And so if you can imagine, I mean, you almost can't imagine what, what that is like, right? Um, so really the thing is to try to uh, practice as much self-care as possible, um, whatever that means to the individual. Um, Hopefully it's a uh, healthy form of self-care. I guess if it's not healthy, then it's not self-care, right? <laughs> so I think, I think that's really what it is. I guess I don't have an answer for that. You know, I, these situations to where, you know, um, there's death and people are dying at the hands of these officers. Um, people who say, uh, you know, for, these, for example, with, with Ray, no, not Ray Sharp Brooks, but with Daniel Prude here in Rochester, the brother of Daniel Prude said, I called the police to help my brother. It was a mental health call. And they killed him. What do you do in that instance? There's nothing. There's no way to mitigate, um, um, or or there's and there's no way to process those feelings. And I can only wonder how Joe Prude and the rest of Daniel Prude's family feels. They, they probably can't erase that pain. There's no way to get rid of it. We have a question from a student here. Um, this is um, yeah. Please, you can see those. You can see those. Okay, great. I I can see them. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here from a student, uh, who's asking specifically about um, your work here in Atlanta, and he says that he himself was quite involved in the protests uh, over the summer and he was struck by how different the experience could be uh, depending on where you happen to go, where, where, you, where one as a protester happened to be. And I, I, I think he's indicating that there are many faces of protests and many tones and qualities of protests. There are types of protests and characters of protests. So how do you, could, do you have some thoughts about about the character of protests in, in this city in particular and how you decided to go where you went and join with whom you decided to join and so on? Um, there, yes, there's definitely um, a lot of differences in, in between the protests that happen in, you know, in different states, um, but also within Atlanta, you know, there were pockets of protesting happening across the city um, and there were all different kinds of, of protests. So I can definitely see why this person from Atlanta asked that question. Um, Minneapolis was really one huge protest. You saw kind of different protests happening across the city, um, but they're usually at the same time. And a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people. Atlanta, there were pockets all across the city, different times. Um, somewhere, somewhere, you know, just, I guess you call it like stationary. They didn't, they didn't move, you know, they didn't move mm -hmm. place like at the um, Olympic Park. They didn't really move. Um, then you had protests at the memorial site. They end up protesting, but usually marching. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think that it's, 
anything um, crazily different than any other city. Uh -huh. You see those things kind of repeat in other cities, but it also, I guess, the one of the big factors is, you know, how the city reacts to, and when I say the city, I'm talking about, let's say, uh, police officers, politicians, so on and so forth, react to the protest. So, mm -hmm. down, is there a curfew? Are they going to heavily police these areas? Yeah. Things, things like that. So, that's what really determines how, mm -hmm. how the protests will kind of last or not. Uh, we have another question that's Atlanta specific. Um, this is from uh, an anonymous attendee who asks, uh, who writes that there's a conversation in my community here in Atlanta surrounding photography at protests. At the height of the demonstrations and protests over the summer, there was concern that photographers who were sharing their images of protesters were unknowingly endangering them in revealing their identity. Um, and this person asks, what do you think about the responsibility of the photographer at times of rebellion or during the very moment of, uh, of sharing pictures when, when there may be um, consequences to their circulation online? I think the true question is who uses the image as a weapon, who weaponizes the image, right? Full thought. So I think that when you have people who continue to use photography as a weapon against the oppressed, that's who you need to go after. So, which includes, of course, police photographing at these protests also. I mean, I, you know, the, pr many people are photographing, as we know, at these protests. Virtually yeah, the, everybody has a camera, including the police. Yes, yeah, the, the photograph of a protest is, is not a new concept. I think that, um, you know, in, in, in journalism, documentary, um, documentary photography, um, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about um, blurring out faces, so on and so forth. Um, however, I do, I do wonder, I do wonder um, about photography and protests from the past, um, maybe even not even that far in the past. I'm talking about the '60s, you know, um, John Lewis, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and the countless others that have. Um, put their lives and bodies on the line to, to um, achieve um, justice for all. I don't believe that they said, you know, cover up my face, I'm gonna be not anonymous in this protest. There are people that may remain anonymous and they weren't um, in the streets marching but protesting in another way. Um, and those avenues are still available. It's all in how you look at, um, I guess, the, the grand scheme of things, right? Right, well, there's a, of, of course, yeah, we know that photography uh, can be liberatory and also oppressive, the same instrument, the same image even can function uh, variously. And we, you know, I guess this is a question for us as photographers, um, about how we handle that ambiguity when we're out photographing. We don't know the consequences of the making of our image or the sharing of our image. We simply don't know. And, and there can be many unwanted consequences, of course. Um, our images can be used for things that, that appall us and, 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 and revolt us. Um, and I think that uh, it's, it's an ongo it's a to me it's a very difficult issue to resolve um, conceptually but when it comes down to the question of whether one should make a picture or not make a picture whether you should attend a protest or not attend a protest um, you know your own ethics I suppose your own intentions have to count first and that's what I guess and I, I that's what I see happening in your case too because that's that's why you make the pictures rather than not make the pictures. 
we have we have one more. If we have time, we have we have another question here that I that I'd be interested to ask or to to pass on to you. Um, this is a question that uh, the, the questioner says. There's a lot of great protest in social injustice photojournalism, um, and there's a lot of beautiful photography, but it's rare that these two things come together. And the questioner says, does your effort to make the work so striking, as striking as it is, ever keep you from getting the picture, from getting the shot? Um, and are there important photographs that you choose not to make because they don't stir you visually or they don't suit your aesthetic? Hmm. No, I think I think I make the images that I make, and that's what you see. We uh, uh -huh. excellent. Yeah, we're we've reached kind of the end of the evening here, and okay. I I think that's a a great line to leave it on, Joshua. We. We appreciate you being here. We appreciate the time. We appreciate your work. If people are uh, wanting to find you, Joshua underscore Rashad on Instagram uh, yes. is your account. And uh, if you'd like to direct people, yeah. Sure. Um, thank you to Jason Francisco and Emory University. Thank you. I'll put the, um, I saw and somebody. Uh, Paper. I'll put up my Instagram. You can DM me about that. Um, about the newspaper. If you'd like that, let me see if I can go back. Okay, there we go. So that's my Instagram there. Just send me a DM and we can see about getting you a paper. There's a there's like a link I'll have to send you to um, information for shipping. Um, you could also go to my website and email me from there if you'd like, but, um, yeah. Um, thank you, Joshua, for a really wonderful presentation. And I'm going to pull up, uh, just two. <laughs> it was excellent, Joshua. I apologize for this lag. I'm just going to talk here and then, uh, be quiet, but, um, I'm going to pull up these last two slides. One of them has the ongoing schedule for upcoming talks from Emory. And then the last slide is upcoming talks with the festival. And, uh, let's see if we can do that. And. And then we'll uh, go. We'll go out. Thank you again, Joshua. That was incredible, and um, really glad to have jo joined with you this evening. Yes, thank you so much. That was a really wonderful presentation, and um, I would welcome uh, all of you attending tonight to join us for our upcoming talks um, at Emory. We'll have two talks, as you can see in the. Um, the poster, uh, the artist uh, Dana Hogard will be our next presenter. And then um, Danza Rogers um, will be presenting on the 10th of November. These are all free and open to the public. You'll, you can see the uh, Zoom link below. Um, so yes, that's my, my plug for our remaining speakers. Well done. Tomorrow night, ACP presents History Rewound, 7 p.m. I promise no lag. And on uh, Tuesday, IGTV will be talking with Terry Darnell about her work on the on the Georgia fence on the Atlanta Best Atlanta Beltline's West Side Trail. And our open exhibition awards go on view on Tuesday, October 20th. Once again, thank you to uh, both Jason and Joshua for joining us for ACP lecture series tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.